Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Karen Tucker. I'm the Churchill Club CEO. We're very privileged to have with us this evening a rock star panel of economists to examine the question, can tech power the next jobs boom? Eric Brynjolfsson, Michael Chewy, Enrico Moretti, Hal Varian, and of course our conversation leader on your far left, Mike Mandel. Welcome and thank you very much for being here. We certainly wish to thank Wharton San Francisco for hosting this program in this gorgeous campus, in this state-of-the-art classroom. Thank you very much as well. A brief introduction for our new guests in the audience. Churchill Club is the top independent forum for business and technology discussions in the Bay Area, now in our 28th year what drives us every day is to encourage innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. And we do this through the up to 40 programs that we present each year, where like minds can learn and connect with one another. Our next program will be held next week on Wednesday, January 23rd at the Hyatt Union Square up here in San Francisco called the Privacy Gap. That's a look at trends in privacy to help move the needle on consumer privacy protection while also supporting innovation and economic growth. On January 30, we look at software-defined networking. Is this the, new, the next networking revolution that will be down in San Jose at Ericsson? And then on February 7, we present Live Ops Chairman Maynard Webb and eBay CEO John Donahoe talking about a new era for work. This is in San Jose at eBay. So we hope you'll join us for at least some of those programs. If you are tweeting tonight, please use the hashtag Churchill Club, and you'll see other Twitter codes in your printed programs. And then let me now call up Doug Collum, Vice Dean of Wharton San Francisco, to say a few words about what's happening here at Wharton and also introduce our moderator. Doug? Thanks, Karen. Um, so welcome to uh, Wharton, San Francisco. Let me quickly ask, how many of you have ever been, have not been here before? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so let me just very quickly give you a, a summary of what this place is about. Um, this is Wharton's West Coast campus. Uh, the campus actually has been here in San Francisco since 2001. We moved in January a year ago from the Folger Coffee Building to the Hills Brothers Coffee Building. <laughs> so our, our uh, Lee's policy is intact. Um, it's a great facility. I, I think you have to agree, it's got to be one of the best venues in San Francisco. Um, I hear about how they're doing new lighting on the bridge, but boy, the sun sets and it's magical. We're so privileged to be here, and frankly, just happy to see everybody else here, too. Um, we are a microcosm of Wharton's main campus in Philadelphia. Our core programs here include the MBA program for executives, which is about 200 students at any one time. Um, this last fall, we started with a cohort of full-time students that came out from Philadelphia to spend a term um, studying startup companies and venture capital. No surprise. We have um, executive education, which is uh, a suite of programs that, that uh, targets managers and executives with companies in the Bay Area. Um, we have um, entrepreneurship here. We have customer analytics, a whole range of other programs and activities. Um, <clears throat> we're really pleased to co-host this program with the Churchill Club. Karen has an amazing organization. Um, I am so impressed with what has been done by the Churchill Club, and it's just tremendous to have an audience like you guys here this evening. So let me introduce quickly our conversation leader, and who in turn is going to each ask each of our other speakers to speak a little bit about themselves and their backgrounds. So Dr. Michael Mandel is Chief Economic Strategist at the Progressive Policy Institute, which is a prominent Washington, D.C.-based think tank that focuses on economic growth, national security, and government policy. 
Uh, Mike's particular focus is on the economic impact of the data-driven economy, the impact of regulation on innovation and measurement issues connected with globalization and innovation. He is also a senior fellow at Wharton's Mac Center, which is a Philadelphia-based research center <laughs> that concentrates on emerging technologies and innovation grounded in business. So uh, before that, in the previous 21 years, Mike spent um, as a journalist at Business Week, where he was named one of the top 100 business journalists of the 20th century for his writings on innovation and growth. So please join me now in welcoming our panel. Mike, I turn this over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so glad to be in this beautiful facility with this um, superstar, not just a rock star panel, but a superstar panel of economists uh, to talk about this incredibly important issue. Uh, before really turning it over to them, let me say a little bit about where this where this topic came from. And this topic really came to me when I was watching the presidential debates. And I was sitting there saying, these guys are talking about coal and autos. How come they're not talking about the internet and technology? How come they're not even mentioning the internet? How come they're not mentioning the contribution of the tech sector to jobs? Wait, what century are we in? And you go and you look. I, I, you go and look at the transcript. You discover that that there was virtually no mention of the internet or smartphones or mobile or tech-driven jobs or pretty much anything that anybody in this room would be thinking about. It was amazing. Now I spend my time in D.C. and of course in D.C. jobs are job number one. And there's little grasp there of the number of jobs being, being created by the tech sector. And in particular, there's little grasp that this might in fact be what creates enough jobs to lift us out of the jobs doldrum. Let me actually give a few statistics before turning this over to the panel, who will get the honor of introducing themselves. We're being very efficient here. Um, over the last year, the um, number of people working in computer and mathematical occupations has gone up by almost 10%, while we've had less than 2% job growth in the rest of the economy. This growth in the tech sector has been both broad and deep. You know, the BLS lets us break it down by uh, by, res by race and ethnic group. So you look at um, blacks, okay? And the number of blacks in computer and mathematical occupations has gone up by 18% over the last year. You look at Hispanics, and do you know what the growth has been there? Anybody want to guess? 50% increase a 50% increase among people who identify themselves as being Hispanic or Latino ancestry. This is fourth quarter to fourth quarter. What about geographically? I'll give you a couple statistics there. Very, very interesting. You look at help wanted ads. Okay. Over the last year, the number of help wanted ads for computer software engineers in the San Francisco area has gone up by about 50%. Very impressive. In New Orleans, the number of want ads for computer software engineers has gone up by 146%. New Orleans is doing great work down there. Wichita, ads for computer software engineers up by 100%. Oklahoma City, 60%. You look across the country, they very broad increase in tech jobs. It's not simply here in the Bay Area. It's not in here. It's not in, just in Seattle. Okay. So the 
question we're going to ask tonight to our very, very distinguished panel, and you know, usually when people say this, they sort of, you know, maybe they mean it, maybe they don't. But in fact, in this case, what I did was I sort of figured out the top people in the country on this topic. I said, oh, we're never going to get all of them. And we got all of them. So here's the question. Is this better? Okay. So here's the question. We have this tech boom. How long? How big will it be? Will it be big enough to carry the whole economy? How big are the spillover effects to the rest of the economy? Is the job-destroying effects of technology bigger or smaller than the job-creating effects? Then we're going to sort of move on to policy questions. Will new applications of technology to areas like health and education create jobs or destroy old ones? I'm about to be accused of bad microphone holding. <laughs> OK. There's just too many of me now. Thank you. Okay. What can policy do to affect both tech job growth and the spillover? And the big picture question have we reached a turning point in the economy? Is digitization going to create a permanent split in the economy between those who have good jobs and those who don't? Or is this really the dark before the dawn? Okay. To answer, or at least address these questions, I'm going to turn this over to the panel each of whom are going to introduce themselves, speak for about five minutes. We'll have a conversation up here, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers from the audience. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Like you, I'm very happy to be able to be part of this conversation. I also want to thank uh, Karen Tucker and, and Doug and the, and the Churchill Club for uh, inviting us here. Um, I guess I'm supposed to briefly introduce myself. I'm Eric Brynjolfsson. I'm a professor at the MIT Sloan School. I'm the director of the MIT Center for Digital Business. And I've been working on issues around how technology is affecting productivity, performance, employment uh, for a number of years, most recently especially with uh, my co-author, Andrew McAfee, who's sitting right there, back there in the middle there. He's going to uh, signal when I'm saying the right thing. Or, Stop now. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and a group of, uh, of people at MIT that have been very helpful, graduate students and postdocs called the Digital Frontier Team. Uh, I think that the topic we're discussing right now is really the most important one facing our society. Uh, and it's, it's the great paradox of our era. You see, productivity is at a record high. Profits have never been higher, both in absolute terms and as a share of the economy. Innovation is roaring ahead. GDP is higher than it has been before. Um, all sorts of good statistics. But at the same time, job creation is lagging terribly. The employment to population ratio has been falling ever since not just the Great Recession, but since the late 1990s. And it really hasn't recovered even as, we, as the economy starts turning around. Uh, the drop in unemployment has mostly been because people are dropping out of the workforce. Um, and certainly it's not keeping up with the new people entering the workforce. And even the people who are working, the median wages are lower now than they were in the late 1990s. Now that's, that's very puzzling because I just told you that GDP is at a record high, profits are at a record high. So how can it be that median wages are, are so much lower? And Part of the answer is that as um, profits have been going up, the share of GDP going to labor has <coughs> been falling and is at a 60-year uh, low. And I don't know how good the statistics were before that. So there are many reasons why this is happening. Um, you know, obviously, there's the business cycle um, is part of the story. Um, offshoring and outsourcing, regulatory issues, changes in, in bargaining power and unions and others. But in my view, by far the biggest reason why we're seeing these big changes in the economy is because of the changes in technology, particularly the very rapid advances in digital technologies. Uh, with the exponential improvement because of Moore's Law and the related changes in other parts of technology, computers can now do things that they never could before. And the improvements are doubling and redoubling every few years. And that is leading to unprecedented opportunities for wealth creation and also 
unfortunately, a lot of people aren't keeping up with these changes in organization. Technology can substitute for a lot of jobs and, and, and make it more difficult to do jobs, just as Mike's microphones were making it more difficult for him to do his job there. Um, <laughs> it can also help people do their jobs and make them more effective. And in fact, as, as Mike alluded to earlier, you know, technology has always been creating jobs and it's always been destroying jobs. Uh, 200 years ago, about 90% of Americans worked in agriculture. Now it's less than 2%. Um, now all those people didn't just become unemployed. Technology helped create new industries, new jobs for them to work in, the automobile industry, the computer industry, other things for them to work in. So this is constant churn and turnover as, as some jobs are automated and new jobs uh, come, be, come around. But clearly, the past 10 years has been a little different. Um, it, we haven't been creating jobs as rapidly as we need to in recent years, and we haven't been creating the demand for labor that has to, in order to keep wages up that we used to. Um, there's probably no worse time to be a worker with no special skills because um, those jobs are being automated, especially if you do routine information processing. There's probably no better time to be an entrepreneur who can take use, make use of these technologies and successful as many entrepreneurs have been, I think they're not doing their job fast enough in helping to create even more new industries. Some of, um, Mike mentioned some of the increased demand in a few of those areas, but it hasn't been keeping up in the overall economy. Technology um, doesn't, you know, this is a very important point, technology doesn't automatically uh, lift the fortunes of all people. Tech, improvements in technology can increase productivity and generally have. And through most of the 20th century, the increases in productivity were tightly coupled with improvements in jobs and wages. But there's no economic law that says that has to be the case. It's quite possible for technology to make the pie bigger, but for some people to end up having a smaller slice of that pie. And that's what's been happening uh, recently. Um, there have been different sets of winners and losers because of skill bias technical change, capital bias technical change, and, and what I'll, I'll call superstar bias technical change. We can maybe talk a little bit about that later, um, that some people have benefited in particular. So l let me just um, say in closing that I think that the changes that we've seen in the past decade or so are in many ways just a window on even bigger changes that we're likely to see in the next 10 years because the one thing that is fairly predictable is that these underlying technologies are only going to accelerate further. Each doubling has a bigger and bigger effect than the previous doublings because it's on a bigger base. So that means that the changes, if the te te technology changes are larger, we can expect some more re radical restructuring and changes in the economy. Um, ultimately, I think this is going to be good news because it, it does make the pie bigger and does give us more opportunities for wealth creation. But the grand challenge that I think we face as a society is coming up with a set of organizations and institutions that can match this remarkable change in technology. We haven't been doing the job yet, but I think that that is something that we need to work on. Uh, my name is Michael Chewy. I'm a principal at the McKinsey Global Institute, which kind of makes me sound like I should be on Glee or something like that. But, uh, MGI, as we affectionately call it, is McKinsey and Company's uh, research arm, and I lead some of our firm's research on the impact of long-term technology trends. Um, let, let me just uh, build a little bit on, on some of Eric's comments. And uh, Michael, by the way, you do a great job of setting expectations. So the whole rock star superstar thing, we've got to cut that. We've got to cut that out. No, I, I want to say just a few things. One, a, a bit of a celebration. Number two, a, a set of challenges. Number three, at least point to, to some to dos. So first of all, a celebration. Look, technology and innovation. Look, in the past 30 years, we've created 1.1 billion new jobs globally. Uh, that's, and that's partly because of technology, it's powerful. About 900 million of those jobs are, have, have occurred in emerging markets, mostly because people are moving from farms to urban centers, right? Over 50% of the world's population now lives in cities. Uh, and we know that when people move from ag agrarian situations to urban situations, in fact, productivity increases. So good stuff. Now, question, will that continue? That's, that's, that's one that I think is open for debate. But a set of challenges, you know, some of the research that we've done at MGI has shown there is a tremendous, going forward, there will be a tremendous um, mismatch between supply and demand. So let's just take, let's, let's take, for example, um, college educated, right? And, and it's weird, right? I mean, we sit around at a Churchill Club event, 
I think most of us went to college. Uh, on stage, five out of five of us have PhDs, right? This is not the real world, right? This is pretty a bizarre situation. If you look at the real world, if you look at how many jobs re will require in the world a college education going forward, and compare that you know, roughly in the momentum case, the current course and speed with the number of people who are graduating, et cetera. In the next seven years, by the year 2020, we're gonna have a gap of 38, maybe 40 million, 38 to 40 million jobs that will require college education and we'll, we won't have that, those skills in the labor force. Is this national, globally or national? Globally. Okay. In the US, it's maybe one and a half million, is you know, a, at least one estimate. Right? That's, that's, that's a real challenge. And beyond that, if you actually think, you know, it, in, in advanced countries, it's about 16, 16 to 18 million. In China alone, it's around 21 million. Right? China, just by itself, is going to have a gap that looks like that. And of course, the other thing is that's just, you know, that's everyone who has a, a college degree. You know, people have talked about STEM before, right? Science, technology, engineering, mathematics, the challenge there. You know, not all, not all college degrees are alike. Apologies to those, you know, who have philosophy degrees. I almost got one, but, you know, it, 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 is, it is a real challenge. If you think about the difference between, between someone who graduated with a STEM degree and someone who doesn't, their lifetime earnings discounted back as cash flow is the difference between someone with a STEM degree and someone who doesn't is about half a million bucks, right? half a million U.S. dollars in, in difference in earning potential. STEM jobs are growing at 60% faster than non-STEM jobs. If you look at France, you are five times more likely to be unemployed if you don't have a STEM degree versus if you do. Right? So that matters. And you know, what percentage of people are graduating with STEM degrees in the United States? About 15%. If we actually have to meet the need for STEM uh, needs in the economy, we'll need to double that, closer to 30%. Is it possible? China graduates about 40 42% in STEM, Korea about 35%, and Germany about 28%. So it's actually possible, but it's something that we'll have to do, plus immigration. So other question, you know, is this a problem because of labor force? Is it because we're all aging out, right? It turns out that, you know, fortunately, the US labor force will continue to grow. Even though it will grow older, you know, we're, we're making enough babies and immigrating enough people that our labor force will continue to grow. So what's the problem? Again, it's a supply demand and a mismatch. If you look at people who are quote, low skilled. So in advanced economies, we describe those people as people who don't have college degrees, so have high school or lower. In developing countries, you, we're talking about people with primary or lower. Again, we now have a, we will have a surplus by 2020 of 90 to 95 million people in the world who have only that level of education versus the number of jobs that will exist there. Right? So that's, that's a big challenge as well. In the United States, it's gonna be six to seven million. Six to seven million people who don't have the education required in order to get a job. Right? That's, that's a real, real challenge. Um, so, you know, th that's the challenge. You know, technology, I think, is part of the problem. Right? That's, it's one of the things that's driving some of these, uh, you know, supply-demand mismatches. It's potentially part of the solution as well. So, you know, some of the to-dos are simply around providing transparency into what needs actually are there and how can you fulfill those demands. Some of them about how can you actually you know, educate people in the, in the places and in the, in, to have the skills that we need them to have. But we also need to create demand. We need to create jobs for people who don't have post-secondary education as well. And so thinking through that is, is something else that we can discuss. So, so. Enrico? Thank you. Um, my name is Enrico Moretti, and I am a professor of economics at Berkeley. I mostly work on the labor market and uh, I just published a book uh, titled The New Geography of Jobs that, that tries to answer kind of the question that we are discussing tonight. Uh, the question is, can tech power the next jobs boom? And my answer is, it depends. Are you in a It depends on geography. It depends on where you live. Um, we tend to think of the U.S. labor market as one unified labor market. But the reality is that there are 300 labor markets in this country, one for each metropolitan area. And they have very different dynamics. Uh, there's a group of cities that over the past 20, 30 years has done remarkably well, much better than the rest 
of the U.S. Uh, it includes cities like here, the San Francisco Bay Area, or um, Austin, or Raleigh, or Seattle, or Boston, or uh, D.C. And what these cities have in common uh, is basically two things. One is they have the uh, highly, skilled, uh, highly skilled labor force. They have workers, uh, a labor force that, where, where the average worker is much better educated than, than the rest of the nation. In fact, uh, at least 40 or 45 percent of workers in the city have a college degree or more. Okay. And the second thing they have in common is that they have a large number of highly innovative employers. Uh, high tech, of course, but not just high tech. Uh, innovation takes many forms, uh, and you know, it touches a, you know, finance, it touches marketing, entertainment, uh, and many parts of, of, of the labor force. Um, now, in these cities, workers are extremely productive, extremely innovative, and have among the highest salaries in the world. Um, the gap with the rest of the other cities has been growing for 30 years and, and keeps growing with every passing year. And, and uh, you know, just to give you a, an example, uh, in 1980, uh, a college graduate in Austin uh, was making slightly less than a college graduate in Flint, Michigan. Uh, by now, the college graduate in Austin is making almost twice as much as the college graduate in Flint, Michigan. Remarkably, this is also true for workers who have lower level of education. So an high school graduate in Austin was making much less than an high school graduate in Flint in the 80s. Back in the 80s, Flint was flush with a lot of blue collar jobs for that type of skills. Um, today, the high school graduate in Austin is making more than twice as much as the high school graduate in Flint. Uh, and the gap keeps growing. To me, this is almost the most interesting part of the story, is the fact that the economic success of these high-tech, high-innovation centers with a lot of high-skilled workers benefits not just the high-skilled workers who work in high-tech, but also benefits the broader community at large. And part of the reason is that, uh, is what in the book I call the multiplier effect, is the fact that the vast majority of us uh, will never work in high-tech, uh, even in a place like Silicon Valley or San Francisco, <clears throat> the number of workers in high tech is a small fraction of the workforce. The vast majority of us works in, in, in local services. In fact, the typical number for a typical city is 60 to 70 percent of jobs are in local services. These jobs are, in, you know, are a diverse set of jobs that include anything from the taxi driver, the waiter, the hairdresser, so jobs that don't require a lot of skills, but also the doctors, the nurses, the lawyers, the architects, and so on, the teachers. Uh, now, these jobs, if you look at the data, they do particularly well, and their, their salaries do particularly well in cities where there's a lot of high-tech workers with a lot of salaries to spend and to buy these local services. Um, my estimate suggests that for each high-tech job in a metro area, five additional local service jobs are created in the long run in that metro area. So for each software engineer at Twitter in downtown San Francisco, five jobs for you know, the taxi driver, the therapist, the dog walker, and the, the doctors and the nurses are created in San Francisco. Ultimately, for the cities that are lucky enough to have a thriving high-tech sector, you know, the, 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 their prosperity really injures upon the uh, high-tech sector, but not because the high-tech sector will ever uh, employ the majority of workers in those cities, but because those cities have wealth, wealth that is large enough to support the vast majority of jobs that will never be in high-tech, but will always be in, in, in local services. And so, so, you know, every sector has a multiplier effect, but the high-tech sector is the largest of all. Uh, the, as I said, it's five, by my estimate. When you look at the multiplier effect for manufacturing, is 1.6. So a community that attracts one software engineer can support way more jobs outside high tech than a community that, that, that than attracting one manufacturing job. And I think this is something that is often lost in the policy debate. And there's a, a focus and obsession with good local jobs. Um, the reality is that those jobs are 
falling, uh, they're, they're not coming back, uh, and, the, and that they're not, their multiplier effect is much weaker, uh, and so they're, they're, they're not benefiting the, the community at large. Can I, why is the multiplier higher? Is it because it's a great question. high tech people make more money? Yeah, there are three reasons. One is because high tech people make more money, and therefore they have more money to spend on therapist and hairdresser and, and, and waiter. They, they need the therapist. The therapist for sure. Well, actually, ironically, they also consume more of their income on personal services. Uh, you know, it, the share of income they spend on personal services increases uh, for, uh, with, with income. So. The second reason is that uh, high tech companies themselves consume a lot of local services, everything from uh, the, the janitor to the IT lawyer, uh, and they, they basically they, 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 they go. And the third reason is that the high tech sector is highly, highly uh, um, aggregated. So it, it, there's this cluster <laughs> whereby when you start attracting high tech firm, you're going to attract even more high tech firm in the future. And that means even more jobs outside high tech in the future. Um, so to me, the real question uh, is, how can we foster those high-tech clusters that are increasingly accounting for a, a, a larger and larger share of the US GDP? And, what, and how can we help the cities that don't have those high-tech clusters? Uh, that, you know, the, 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 the Flint, the Detroit, where a small fraction of workers have a college degree and very few uh, companies are, are innovating. I'm Hal Varian. I'm the chief economist at uh, Google and former professor at Berkeley. Uh, if we look at this noise coming out of Washington about jobs, the problem with the, uh, with the Washington view is that everybody wants more jobs and less work. <laughs> and what they mean by more jobs and less work is I want to get a lot, paid a lot of money for doing something that's really fun. <clears throat> right? I mean, don't we all in some sense? So my grandfather once told me, if you love what you do, you'll never have to work a day in your life. And it's true. I venture most of the people out here really enjoy their jobs. But of course, that's not true for all people. Some people are doing unpleasant jobs they don't like, and they would like to, uh, to work less. And if we look at these unpleasant jobs, technology, by and large, has displaced a lot of those jobs that were just not very... Uh, enjoyable. So 200 years ago, people worked 60 hours a week. Uh, 100 years ago, it was 50 hours a week. Uh, 50 years ago, 40 hours a week. It's now, I think, about 37 hours a week. Look at retirement. That's a very important issue as, as well. There was no such thing as retirement up till roughly 100 years ago, and then very, very few people actually uh, live long enough to retire, and now people can anticipate retiring at, uh, at a fairly uh, young age by uh, historical standards. In fact, if you look at the uh, UAW, I used to teach at the University of Michigan, and the UAW workers had this slogan, 30 and out. They wanted to go to work in the auto factories at 20, retire at 50, and then they'd have uh, leisure for the rest of their lives. Didn't quite work out for that as, uh, that way, as we know. Now, if you look back at what economists have said about this, two economists who've, who've written about this were Marx and Keynes. And Marx wrote about what life would be like under communism, because he argued communism would be so hugely productive that people would just have a great deal of leisure time and they would live like country gentlemen, if you read his uh, description. And Keynes wrote about it when he looked at the economics of our grandchildren, where he said capitalism is so productive that uh, in the age of our grandchildren and great-grandchildren, people will be able to spend most of their time uh, and leisure. In fact, I think it's, a, it's an interesting question of why we work as hard as we do, because it's certainly true that you could live uh, the lifestyle of a median uh, person in uh, England in 1920s or 1930s by working a day or so a week at current, at, uh, at current wages. And yet people decided to work the 37-hour, 40-hour uh, work week and consume a lot more than they anticipated uh, 50 years ago. In fact, if you look at the descriptions that Keynes wrote about what life would be like in the future, it looked a lot like Downton Abbey, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, uh, we all know Downton Abbey. You have these uh, wealthy aristocrats, and you have these very hardworking servants. The aristocrats seem to change clothes, what, four or five times a day, and eat a lot of food, and go hunting and picnicking, and all these things. How well, that was, what, what would, that was what life would be like, yeah. Now, of course, you say, ah, but we don't have servants. Well, no, we do have servants. 
We have a lot of robotic servants, for example. We have dishwashers. We have vacuum cleaners. We have washing machines. We have taxi drivers uh, who are providing the same kind of services that were provided to those Downton Abbey people. Technology has made the cleaning, the washing, the laundry, all those things much, much more efficient. And so you didn't have to have as much labor component to provide those household chores. You could do a lot of it by machine. And that's exactly what um, all of us have done. And in fact, if you think about the hard working cook down there in the kitchen, well, we all have cooks. You know, the, big, the highest profit margin or, or most supermarkets make their money out of the prepared food because you're always buying the prepared food at the supermarket. Or, of course, if you live here in uh, San Francisco, you go out and eat at some of those wonderful restaurants that Enrico is talking about. So we have cooks. It's just that the, instead of having a, having a single cook per household, the technology has made the cooking process so much more efficient that you have single cooks that serve many customers rather than just, uh, just one family. Um, I think the, uh, I, I was talking with some uh, friends earlier today about this, uh, this, this model of, of service work that's partly robotic and partly uh, human. They were telling me the, the hot occupation in San Francisco now is household manager. So you can get your own Mr. Carson or Mrs. Hughes to manage your household. If you've got a double income and kids, that's going to be a great relief to pay somebody you know, probably a fairly uh, substantial uh, salary to come to your house one day a week. So instead of having Mr. Carson and Mr. Hughes furnishing this single household, you'd have a household manager who would service five or six households. You've got the economies of scale in managing the households, you've got the experience, you've got the knowledge, it's a lot more efficient to perform that kind of task through that model than it is to do it from the uh, Downton Abbey model. So I think we're going to continue to see exactly the kind of, of story that Enrico said. There will be some people who are doing uh, high tech or let's say high, tr high education uh, work that demands high education. There'll be a lot of other people providing services for that group but it's not sort of menial service in the sense that you would normally think about it. It tends to be high-level professional service, which can be very good uh, jobs. Okay, I've decided to sort of throw out some of the questions I was going to ask this panel. But listening to them has brought a completely different question to my mind. Okay, if I look out 10 years from now, okay, and you talked about the transformation from, 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 from agriculture and invention to manufacturing, okay? So if we think, and, and Enrico, you sort of talked about how the, how the, how the cities, the metropolitan areas, which are sort of tech-based, are growing faster and are stronger than the ones that aren't, okay? And you talked about how we were generating a lot of jobs that we don't have enough people to fill, okay? And so the question is, if we looked out 10 years from now, are we sort of looking at an economy where the tech sector broadly construed? is a much bigger share. Is that kind of where we're going? And you can define this any way you want. I'm thinking about you know, what our transformation looks like. And you, know, you were saying, Hal, that maybe, Enrico, maybe Washington is barking up the wrong tree here. Maybe the growth sectors of the economy now really are the growth sectors of the economy. And that this is, in fact, where the new jobs are going to be it's going to take us a while to sort of catch up. We'll generate some of the service sector jobs that come around. So I'm asking you to kind of visualize in the medium term the five to ten year frame that the CBO uses to sort of think about budget. Okay? Yeah. So, so let me take a, a cut at that. And I think the tech sector is certainly a, a huge growth sector. It's growing in share of its GDP in terms of what it's con contributing. Employment, as you mentioned, is growing. But I think we also have to keep it in perspective. It's still a very small slice of the economy, and you can create an enormous amount of value in tech without a lot of jobs, per se. That's not a bad thing. I think Hal's exactly right. I mean, the goal is not to create more work, per se. It's to create more value. But, it, but to, specifically to your question of job creation, just consider this. Uh, Hal's company, uh, Google, Apple, um, Facebook, um, Amazon, you put them all together, um, and they add up to a little less than a trillion dollars in market cap. That, that's quite a bit. Um, uh, Andy did a nice blog post where he then looked at the jobs, Andy McAfee, um, the jobs that were created by that, and it worked out to be 186,000 jobs total for all of that wealth creation. 
Now, I'm not saying that's bad news. That, that's great that they're that productive and that efficient. But 186,000 jobs is maybe about what the U.S. economy needs to create per month in order to keep up with population growth and to keep the uh, um, employment to population ratio um, constant. So um, it is growing. It's growing fast. But I don't think we're going to be creating four companies like that per month uh, going forward. And so by itself, that is not um, going to be a, a dominant share of the job rate. That said, technology can create jobs in lots of other areas and can, can uh, simplify the way work is done in lots of areas and in areas like healthcare and education and retailing and manufacturing. And you're, not so, so you're not so optimistic about where. Well, no, I, I just think that, 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 that it's, it's not the right way to look at it is to look at specifically narrowly in the tech sector. It should be looking at what technology is enabling in other sectors. Anybody want to add anything, please? Sure. Um, I, I, you know, if you look at the last 20 years, uh, jobs in the Internet sector or software or uh, pharmaceutical research, um, they've grown much faster than the rest of the economy. They've grown, uh, depending on the sector, between five to ten times faster than the rest of the labor market. Um, will they ever be the majority of jobs? No, I agree with you. They're always going to be a minority of jobs. But that's okay, because the majority of jobs will always be uh, local services. Seventy percent of the jobs will always be local services. What we need is to fill up the 30 percent of the jobs that create the wealth that then is spent on local services. Okay, it used to be manufacturing. At, at its peak, manufacturing employed no more than 35 percent of the U.S. workforce. So even in the 1950s, and we're talking about the years when what was good for Ford was good for the U.S. and vice versa, or GM. General Motors. <laughs> GM. Uh, so even at the peak of his might, manufacturing was employing a third of the U.S. workers. Right now, depending on how you define it, you know, the, the general definition of the innovation sector probably would include around 8 to 10 percent of the U.S. workforce. And, and uh, that includes not just high tech, but includes many other parts of the workforce that are doing innovative jobs. Um, it will never be uh, 50 percent of our jobs, but it doesn't have to be 50 percent of our jobs. All, it only needs to employ uh, a third of the workforce that it's what economists call the traded sector, the sector that sells goods and services outside, uh, outside the nation and therefore brings in wealth that then is spent in local services. Um, now, the share of local service jobs have, have, been, have been growing uh, steadily, uh, in part for the reasons that, that Hal was talking about, uh, and will probably keep growing. Um, We'll never, uh, you know, we'll probably be between 60 and 75 percent, depending on, on the region. Yeah, I have to agree with my esteemed uh, fellow panelists. In terms of the national challenges, right, 20 million new jobs, hard for the tech, tech sector to fill that. I think on a regional basis, though, if you look around here, it's going to be a tremendous driver, and perhaps, you know, other regions in the country. But if you, if you look in aggregate, it's... Um, you know, it's going to have to be other jobs that really fill that, fill the rest of the pie. Well, the other jobs being ones that sort of spin, uh, that are, that are, that are spillovers, or, well, let me just sort of, bet, let me, do you want to, do you want to Well, now? I was going to say one thing, I absolutely agree, it's got to be services is where the job growth, it's been that way for, whatever, 30, 40 years, and we tend to think of services as cooks and waiters and gardeners, but, but of course, there are also the doctors, the lawyers, the accountants, and all this high-level services. Trouble with services is kind of a catch-all occupational category. It has a great range of skills, training, income, etc., within that uh, the category. But the job growth really uh, has to come from that uh, sector. But I think the important distinction that Rico made is there are jobs that are localized to a sector, and then there are jobs that are tradable from uh, given areas to other areas, and it's those jobs, which could be the manufacturing jobs, or could be the high-tech jobs, or could be other jobs that are creating the local pockets of wealth. So you mentioned the gap both globally and nationally between the, between the jobs that, that, what the demand is, and then what the supply is, okay? Is there a sort of... Nominally, I mean, you know, the market will clear somehow, but yeah. The market will clear somehow, okay. Um, coming from coming from 
D.C. at this point. That's, you know, <laughs> the, uh, the politicians and the policymakers have a hard time with that sentence. Okay. I mean, the question, the, see, what I'm looking at at this point is I'm sort of looking, I'm looking at a, at, at a world in which there is job growth in the tech sector. There is a demand for people in the tech sector. It's the only thing that's really kind of growing at this point. Job wise. Okay. There's very little other things in the U. If you look at if you look at the occupation, there isn't very much other growth. Okay. Outside the healthcare sector, right? you sort of say healthcare, you say tech, you've pretty much accounted for for everything that's going on. So if you were a policymaker at this point, what would you do? Well, I, 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 for my sense, I, for my sense I once was in government, uh, <laughs> and I, I will stipulate that we do not uh, uh, institutionally provide uh, policy guidance. But let me, let, yeah, let me throw out some, some options, some options that that you might want to think about. Um, you know, number one is uh, providing transparency into where the demand really is uh, for jobs. Um, there. Uh, that's something that really doesn't exist in a, in, in, in a way that's effective. Um, it's unclear that people who are making educational decisions, even an individual student or someone who's trying to make a lifelong learning decision, knows where the demand is going to be. I'm going to stop, I'm going to yeah. stop you right here. Okay, so every time on this panel that I sort of point out that the tech sector might be sort of driving growth, people kind of resist this. Okay, there's a resistance to sort of saying that this is going to be an important source of job growth. I that's positive. Not, not at this end, yeah, not, not at this end. <laughs> okay, so if I was to sort of, if I was to sort of go to a college student, okay, for example, my son who has just graduated, okay, and sort of say, say well, this distinguished panel of people say there's going to be an increase, but they're not going to tell you that, that, this is, that there's going to be a continued job boom in tech jobs or in STEM jobs, okay? What, are, what would you be willing to tell them at this point? Because I can tell you what I would be willing to tell them. I'd be willing to sort of say to them that we have a technologically based society which is going to continue to demand these kind of skills. And that, you, that in fact when the Census Bureau reports that people who major in computer science make more than anybody else over the course of their lifetime, that this is something that you can actually count on. So my question to you, and I'm apologize for being provocative, but but why won't you say this? To them? I will say I will say that there's a boom in STEM jobs. I will, you know, I will quote quote Hal, who says, you know, those statisticians will be the sexy job of the next ten years, right? So, <laughs> but those jobs aren't all going to be in quote the tech sector. But that's right. fine. I'm not okay. saying the tech sector. I'm saying tech type jobs. Well, no, no, this is this is a very important distinction, and I just want to. I think that may be part of the 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 issue here is that I think the whole economy is becoming more technified, to uh, make up a word. Um, you know, Mark Andreessen talked about how software was embedding itself in more and more parts of the economy. So it's not just the traditional tech sector, but if you look at retailing, what's happened there, you look at manufacturing, you look at banking, you look at distribution, and soon education, not soon enough, um, each of those are becoming much more computer, and software intensive, and the characteristics of them are changing, not just in terms of hiring more STEM grads, but uh, we did, Andy and I did some work on what's happening uh, to the nature of competition. In these other industries, it's becoming much more Schumpeterian, where there's much more turbulence, there are more winner-take-all markets. The kinds of characteristics we've seen in the internet sector and the software sector are now common in the other sectors of the economy, much more so than they were 30 years ago. I think it's because those sectors have become technified. Yeah, another technified point, right? I mean, some people say soon, you know, chief marketing officers are going to spend more on IT than CIOs. Mm -hmm. so right. If you look at by function, you could look at different functions. The same thing in so, marketing. So finance. do your marketers, do your marketers at that point need tech skills? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. What's the tech? <laughs> yes. Because I'm concerned now. I'm concerned with the question about what we tell our students. Because you you started with transparency. Yeah. That's why I interrupted you. And transparency, because right now, right now in Washington, you're not actually getting the message to people that. Here, let me throw out a provocative one, just to be provocative too. Let's stop teaching calculus. Let's, let's teach a lot more statistics. <coughs> it's 
not totally true. I think calc is still valuable, right? But which, you know, which skill really matters in, in business, right? Is it understanding, Absolutely. you know, uncertainty, uh, dirty data, you know, making decisions based on probability and conditional probability and, you know, bias and samples, et cetera, or is it integrate? If you want your kids to be sexy, you should teach them statistics. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let, me, let me tell you, let me, let me tell you what Nate Silver said. I interviewed Nate a few uh, weeks ago who wrote the blog for the New York Times and did the election forecasting that you all may be familiar with. I said, how did you get into this area? He said, well, if they hadn't outlawed online poker, I'd probably still be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> because he uses all the skills he just described as well. <clears throat> so You're the good not thing suggesting that people become online poker players. I just, I just saw <laughs> an elementary statistics book it's called Introduction to Probability Using Texas Hold'em. I bought that book. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, let's keep, let's, 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 I, I want to stick for a second with transparency, because I actually think transparency and the connection between, because one of the things that sort of drives me nuts is when I see the Census Bureau figures, so I mean, I've got two kids, one of them went into, is majoring in psychology. Okay, well, psychology is the one that the, comes up at the lowest on the, um, and the question is, so what do you tell, I mean, what do we want to tell the kids who are getting an education, not just a college education, but, but uh, an associate's degree, what do you want to tell them? What can you tell them that's persuasive about where the growth is going to come from and what they should be learning? Transparency here, okay? And conversely, if I get a senator or a congressman in a back room somewhere, okay, <laughs> Don't run them out. <laughs> no. No. No, that's not going to happen. Okay. Um, what should I tell them? Um, because should I tell them, what should I tell them about where the growth is? Should I tell them that we're not going to have manufacturing growth and they should just basically teach everybody statistics? Okay. What should I, what should I tell them? Let me, let me quote an authority on this. Barbie. Barbie said, math is hard. And she was right. It is hard, I think. It is hard because, because it's hard. Not everybody can do it, and not everybody has the perseverance to do it, and not everybody invests the effort. And so you have a scarcity premium from having something that people find hard. And so what I would say advise your kids is take at least one hard subject every semester because then you'll get something that's hard. There won't be as many people who have the put the effort in that you do, and that will have some scarcity value. Uh, it, you know, the secret is to be uh, an expensive complement to something that's becoming cheaper and cheaper. And what's becoming cheaper and ubiquitous is data. And what's the expected, uh, what, what's the complement to the data? It's an analyst, a person who can get meaning out of that data. And so that's why I think uh, statistics is, the, uh, is going to be the the sexy job of the next decade because we've got all of this data. Everybody's put in a data warehouse. Everybody has uh, data on tap. And the challenge is how can we use this data to improve the way our economy operates, our business operates, our society operates? Math is hard, agreed. Um, but that being said, other countries are graduating twice, yes. STEM graduates at yes. twice the, the, the rate that we are. Now, I'm not saying we should copy all of the educational schemes in other countries, but again, Germany's at 28%, Korea's at 35 China's at 42 we're at 14 I mean, unless our guys are dumber. No, and guys yes, is, those, I meant that in a neutral, to work gender hard. neutral guys, but yeah. yes. Now, do you see this as a way to sort of generate more jobs in the U.S. economy in the long run? We're in the short run. See, what I'm looking at, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to address Eric's problem, okay? Now, you're real problem, Eric. No, no. Okay, I'm trying to address Eric's problem at the same time thinking about this in a Washington framework. Okay. If I was to sort of tell them what a good policy would be at this point, to sort of unite the sort of the growth in tech jobs with the lack of job growth in other parts of the economy with the exception of healthcare. What am I telling you? 
Well, let me make, let me make one point about this uh, this STEM jobs. Is this multiplier of five that we heard about from Enrico applies just as well if you import somebody from Germany or India or China as it does if you home grow them. So it's true that the STEM jobs are going to be good. I think they'll have a multiplier even if we have a, uh, a more open immigration policy. And if you talk to everybody in Silicon Valley, they complain about the immigration policy. So one way to get a boost in employment for those local services jobs is to uh, import some of these STEM workers. But the long run solution is I think we have to be educating the STEM workers as well. And it's hard to convince a college sophomore to take uh, this tough course when there's this uh, easy course that they uh, find available. But that's what Half it a takes. Million bucks, though. I know, I understand. They've got to they've got to learn that and they've got to see the examples uh, to see motivate the people them. Who get poor by not taking the right courses. Okay, I think what I would have <laughs> You know, people learn by somebody else's experience. We're going to have a quick lightning round here. We're going to give one proposal that they would sort of tell if they could sort of transmit either to the, either to the national government or to the state and local government that would, um, uh, that might make a difference in sort of uniting the, the tech job increase with a larger job increase. Well, I'm just going to build on this, on this uh, theme of education. I think that we need to reinvent education, not just invent, m invest more in it, but to apply the technology that's transformed all those other industries to the way we do education to make it easier to, for, for it to be distributed at a low cost, but also create a learning model for the teachers so they can understand better what's working and what's not working, the kind of things you see in Khan Academy and edX and Udacity and other areas. And I'm hopeful that this time it will be for real that we have that reinvention. Mm. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to have two things. One is transparency to demand um, for high skill jobs, uh, whether it's statisticians or technology or whatever. Second one is we cannot give up on the low skilled, this, this millions of people who will be low skilled and need jobs. And whether or not it's Downton Abbey, you know, some type of, you know, professionalized, personalized home services, health care, elder care. We need to create those jobs, too. Um, I would have to say R&D tax credit. Um, there is growing evidence, uh, and, you know, solid academic evidence that, that once a firm innovate and spend money in R&D, uh, obviously it benefits from that innovation, but also its competitors, especially those that are located nearby, learn from that innovation and also benefit. Uh, there's, a, there's a wealth of new studies uh, uh, by economists at Stanford and LSE that actually quantify that. And, and, and that suggests that there's a market failure in the creation of, of new knowledge, that, that the, the innovators capture only part of the benefit that they, they bring, uh, that, that they, 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 they generate. Uh, and so, you know, R&D task credit are one way to, to internalize that, that, that market failure, to, to correct for that market failure. Uh, the problem is that uh, they're way too low relative to the social benefit uh, of innovation. Uh, and also they are, they are not permanent, they are year to year, which makes no sense because innovators obviously have, you know, you, you invest today for, uh, and you need, uh, you need some payoff in the future. So, so I would say we need to significantly increase R&D tax credit and to make them permanent. It's not, uh, to, it's not, a, it's not a, a moral argument. It's not because uh, you know, we want to support a specific sector, but it's because in the, it's in the interest of the U.S. economy to internalize this, this externality. And it's going to create jobs, certainly in the, in the long run, hopefully also in the short run. So in the short term, I would say the, uh, a, a smarter immigration policy for high-skilled workers and entrepreneurs uh, these are job creators, and they will employ the low-skilled workers for exactly the reasons we heard about early in the panel. For the long run, it's got to be uh, educational policy um, to produce more better trained workers. Uh, that's tough for the reasons we described, but I think you have to attack the problem on both fronts. I think um, we're now ready to turn to questions from the audience. Um, who, which side is first here? All right, let's go for that side. Uh, hi. 
Professor Moretti, so I have your book here, and it's a, okay. <laughs> it's a fascinating response to Friedman's The War is Flat, and I think it's, it's, it's a very thoughtful. In your book, you talk about the three Americas. Um, we've discussed about America number one, Great America, number three, concerning. So I, I just wanted to get your thoughts about number two, and if that number two is actually in disadvantage with Brazil, Florianopolis, Chile, or other centers of thought like um, the Bangalore or Israel. Are we at a disadvantage against them or not? So to bring everybody up to speed, because I'm, I'm uh, flattered that you, you, you read my book, but probably you're the only one here. <laughs> uh, it is a great book. You should read it. And, and Eric, has, Eric and Andrew have a book, too, and you should read that one. Uh, so the three Americas that is referring to is the first America will be the Americas of the brain hubs, these innovation clusters with highly skilled workers and highly innovative employers that are doing better and better and better. The third America is the, the Flints and Detroits and the Clevelands that are falling apart. Uh, uh, they're losing population and, and falling wages. And the second America is sort of the, the vast majority of US, U.S. metro areas that are sort of in between. And they, they could go either way. They seem undecided on, on which direction to take. And they, they have uh, a labor force that is fairly skilled but not very, very skilled. And they have a mix of employers and they don't but, but the, there's, no, there's not a lot of innovation, there's not a lot of, a lot of, um, um, uh, a lot of creation of new ideas, new products, and, and salaries have been stagnating. Um, the, you know, what to do about America number two? Uh, what's clear is that what we're doing now is not working. We, we are spending... Um, about between 40 to 60 billion dollars annually in policies that are designed to attract, to invest, you know, to attract outside investment to, to, to Middle America, and they're, they're not working very well. It's, it's often a zero-sum game where each locality is competing against other localities by offering subsidy to, to new, you know, to, to companies to come to that location. Um, but you know, the, the winners comes at the cost. You know, they, they, it's a zero-sum game where, 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 where the investment was going to go somewhere. It goes, it goes to, say, uh, Indianapolis or it goes to, to Houston uh, at the expenses of, of, of some other city. Uh, so I, I think we should really rethink uh, a lot of the local economic development policies that, that uh, have been put in place uh, that are benefiting only those companies, but they're not benefiting the, the communities that, that end up overpaying to attract jobs to, to, that, to those localities. Uh, and we should really focus on, on I, I think, uh, on, on, on attracting skilled workers. That's, that's the key uh, predictor of economic success of the community uh, for the past 20 years, and is likely to be even more important in the next 20 years. So if Second America wants to become more like America number one, uh, the key recipe should be education, education, education. Next question. Hi, this actually kind of piggybacks perfectly on where you were going, but um, I've been hearing a lot of reports and reading a lot about how there's a lot of vacancies in um, specific vocational trades, specifically within the clean tech sector. Um, we've created a lot of job growth for servicing these um, different, manu or different solar panels and things like that, but there aren't people skilled and trained in how to service them, manufacture them, and things like that. Um, I'm really curious in hearing, you guys have mentioned that education and getting people specifically to study more within the STEM um, sector um, when they're picking their um, focus, but what about vocation? What are your thoughts on helping, focusing on educating people in that specific sector to help grow the economy? Okay, vocational jobs you're asking here. Yes. I don't have recent data on, on it. Um, there, it clearly is uh, another type of construction which uh, you know people are going to have to be trained on. I think it is a, a, a potential option, um, but there are some challenges in clean tech right now um, uh, because, amongst other things, shale gas uh, is, has, has changed the economics of uh, energy in the U.S. So, um, you know, that's a challenge from a carbon footprint standpoint. Um, but, you know, I think, I think there is some potential there, but I, I actually wonder about how that's doing right now. I don't have current data on it. 
Let me just briefly, I, I very much agree with the, the premise of your question. This is one of the areas where the United States has done particularly badly, and there's countries like Germany who, which have been very effective with a vocational uh, set of programs where people uh, complete uh, K through 12 and then they get vocational training and Mercedes and BMW and other companies hire them. And that's one of the reasons that they have success in those manufacturing areas. We um, leave people sort of to fend for themselves, and a lot of them aren't able to match because there isn't the transparency to know which kinds of uh, skills will actually be valued by the marketplace, and they aren't trained. So there may be many people who, who would be qualified to do those jobs if they got a little bit of training, but there isn't the matching available and the training to do it. That's one of the areas where we have to do this reinvention of education. It's not just in higher education. It's not just K through 12 but it's also vocational and not out of fourth one, which is lifelong learning. Let me actually just add one thing here which relates to your transparency. You know, so clean tech jobs are not actually all that prevalent right now, but they might be <coughs> 10 years from now. Our, our methodologies for doing job forecasting are terrible, okay? The, uh, the BLS, you know, everybody looks at the BLS forecasts. The BLS forecasts, They've done their own internal studies, and you can actually do just as well by kind of just doing straight line extrapolation. Okay, this is not saying anything bad about the BLS. It's difficult to do these types of forecasts, but to the degree to which we're going to want people to go into things that are growing, one of the things that economists have to learn is actually how to sort of do better job forecasts. And I think if you sort of ask you know, ten, for 10-year forecasts of clean tech jobs, you get a wide variety of sort of, of possibilities. Let, let me just suggest that um, forecasting is great, but what a lot of, and, and the more better we can do it, the, the, the better. But if you look at a lot of retailing and manufacturing, they have moved away from forecasting towards rapid response to demand conditions. There may be something similar we can do in the labor market. If we have more of the, the visibility, um, people like Reid Hoffman at LinkedIn are trying to create systems whereby people can very quickly realize where the jobs are this year, the next year, the year after. And you know, that may not be as effective for if you, you need to invest you know, five or 10 years in training for a career, but if it's something more short term, um, that, that's much easier to do it, it, conceptually to get that um, just in time visibility to where those clean tech and other jobs are right now and, and react to those. Next question. Clean tech is a different market if there's a price for carbon. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So uh, I've heard a fair bit of conversation now on, on thoughts on economic or um, educational policy. But if, if you look to the history of the growth of the Silicon Valley and what drove the Bay Area, it was access not only to the educated workforce, but also access to capital. And investment policy, whether it's governmental, tax codes or just whatever it takes to drive an investment policy, it seems to me at least that the investment behavior in the risk capital sector of the market has gone through a tremendous change in the past five or eight years. And much of what we're describing is absent from the dialogue of the people with the capital that are investing in companies now. The, the, the growth prospects they look for, much like the conversation on the LinkedIn education, uh, you know, the, what the capital investor, the capital source in the market is looking for today is uh, not a technology development roadmap, but a six-month cash roadmap. And what is the prospect for the tech sector going forward in the 2020 horizon if nobody's doing technology funding and technology development, but only looking to capitalize on the existing technologies. Well, one, one factor you left out, which I think is very important, is the role of defense in uh, innovation in the tech industry. And it played a very, very large role. I mean, the, the internet came out of uh, DARPA with the driverless car, which uh, Google has, has uh, publicized quite a bit. That was a 10-year project by DARPA funding 10 universities to develop the technology for driverless cars. 
uh, and uh, Google came in and added some very uh, important features ba based on Street View and, and, uh, our, uh, and Google Maps and was able to bring that technology to the verge of, uh, of commercial uh, success. The next thing that's coming, I'm quite sure, is, is robotic surgery because DARPA has had a 10-year project in that. And drones, which also we know of, it was developed by uh, the military initially, does have many civilian applications, which we'll see in the next several years. Well, if we, you know, would like to have a more peaceful world, I think all of us could agree on that, but, but you have to observe that the military in the past has pushed a lot of technology. It's been the source of a lot of this patient money that you're describing, these 10-year investments. That you that you find that is very hard to find in the private sector. I I, I might challenge the premise a little bit. I mean, I think uh, the funders have complained about the entrepreneurs. Nobody's working on the hard fundamental problems, right? You know, I, I you guys promised me cars on the moon, and I got 140 characters and all that type of stuff. And you know, the entrepreneurs say, I don't, I can't find patient capital. You know, no one wants to fund the, the fundamental stuff. So. I, it's hard for me to say in the years that I've been around here that that dynamic has changed all that much. I mean, there's an interesting stuff, more angel stuff and all, all, all those sorts of things. It's hard for me to say that. I will say, though, you know, I mean, one of the things that makes this place really special, I mean, we have world-class universities, we have world-class talent, we, we do have access to capital. There are people in Sand Hill Road who do want to invest in companies, et cetera. But, you know, I, but that stuff people are trying to replicate all over the world. I think one of the powerful things we have here is this dense web of personal interconnections, right? I mean, if I go and go into a restaurant, like, you know, downstairs, right, people are going to be talking about this stuff. Um, you know, white combinators a few blocks away. And, and I think that's a lot of the secret sauce, which other places don't have yet. Not that they don't get, but they don't have that yet. How many meetups are going on tonight other than what we're doing here? And so I think that's what's really powerful about this place, in addition to the fact that it's tech-based and our multiplier is high and all that type of thing. And I think that's you know that's the, the you know the magic that we have to keep happening here. Uh, I think funding is still there. I really you know, do. Let, let me just add one more thing to that. If I look, I'm with you, Michael. I don't see so much of a funding problem, but in areas like biosciences, there's a regulation issue. Okay, so there's a lot of areas here where you run into ro either regulatory roadblocks or sort of obstructions or things that just take a lot longer because they have to sort of go through a long process. And then there's a real question about whether or not there's regulatory bottlenecks in places like the FDA. And the FDA, as it turns out, has a very hard time dealing with productivity enhancing innovation. So there's a whole set of innovations that would be very logical to sort of invest in that the investors know are going to have a hard time getting approved at the FDA end. Right now, the FDA is, in, is grappling with the idea of M Health, which apps are going to have to, uh, you know, have to go through the sort of intense FDA process for approval, and where they draw the line is going to matter for where the investment goes in. So I, I'm not sure. I think, in some sense, the, the whatever the capital problem is, maybe being partly a shadow of the regulatory problem. Next question. We're on the other side here. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm a little surprised I haven't heard anything about um, what I think is a key part of the future infrastructure, which is broadband, especially since we have Hal on the panel here. Uh, where are we, uh, where do you think we are as a country uh, in, in terms of uh, broadband and where are we going in the future and where does that place us in global competitiveness? Because Australia and a number of other countries are investing uh, in, in broadband, and it seems like we're falling behind, partly for maybe the structure of that industry as an oligopoly. But uh, I would love to hear what the panel thinks about the importance of broadband and what, what you see uh, where we're heading with that. Well, uh, uh, since you mentioned my name, I'll say a few things about it. When you look cross-country, you really have to be very careful about what, what the existing infrastructure look like, because there's a certain amount of leapfrogging going on. We build out cable in the U.S., and so we can provide Internet service through cable, and it's pretty good, really. Uh, but a country that didn't build out cable, like Italy, for example, they were doing DSL over the phone lines and satellite TV. 
uh, th then they can put in fiber. All right, so fiber is going to be a lot, lot better. And the problem in the U.S. is we've got a pretty good technology now, and do we want to spend that money to replace it with a really good technology? And the alternative is uh, spectrum policy that makes more sense. I mean, we could have a much more intelligent spectrum policy in the U.S. There's a lot of bandwidth out there. If you're using uh, LTE from Verizon or, uh, or AT&T, uh, you know what I mean. It's really quite impressive the kind of bandwidth you can get if you use some of the newer wireless technologies. So my guess is you have to have the fiber to make the wireless work well in terms of the backhaul, but I think we're going to see the biggest action in the U.S. on the wireless side, in my opinion. Uh, the wireless in the U.S. is, is, is pretty good compared to places. The, the, the uh, high-speed wireless is pretty good compared to other places at this point. Partly for the leapfrogging. Part, partly for the leapfrogging, exactly. When you have a pretty good system in one country, the incremental cost for the incremental value may not look so attractive. And so, you know, you're going to see this happen around the world where there will continue to be a mix of technologies and we may be lower on the list in broadband and higher on the list in wireless broadband. Some other country has a different mix, so it just depends on the, on the way your uh, particular telecom infrastructure develops. Next question. Um, hi. I want to go back to our earlier discussion about education. I think one trend that really shows um, sort of the intersection between education and technology is recently there has been the rise of free online education, um, massive open online courses, um, things like Coursera, for example, which partners with, with you know, Wharton, MIT, Stanford, et cetera. So I, I just wanted to get your, what are your thoughts on these, the, these companies like Coursera, for example, and you know how sustainable are they as a um, alternative to uh, traditional education, which is very expensive compared to these. Well, I'll say a little bit about it. So, so MIT ha has something called MITx that's done with Harvard and Berkeley that um, created a, a, a edX program. There's Coursera. There's uh, Udacity. There, there's the um, Khan Academy I mentioned earlier uh, at the K through 12 level. Uh, personally, I, I'm actually extremely optimistic about this. People have been talking about bringing online education for for over a decade, but um, having spent a little time working with the people who are who are doing these, I'm I'm very encouraged. Not just because this is bringing education to a lot more people, but as I suggested earlier, I think the the real interesting thing is the way it's creating a closed loop learning system where people can understand better what works for education and what doesn't work. You know, our friends in, in advertising have been optimizing how to get people to click on ads with, you know, great success. And I some, know some super smart statisticians and, and data scientists who have, they're doing that. And I talked to them, why are you doing that? And they said, well, this is where the data is. We have a ton of data about what people are clicking on. Now, eventually, now, now, now finally, we're getting a lot of data on people who are learning online and what works for learning and what doesn't, which, how you teach the quadratic equation that people get it and people, which ways people don't get it. And you can iterate on that, and that's going to create not just a higher level of <laughs> productivity and performance, but I think more importantly, a higher growth rate, a higher improvement rate over time as we figure out which, which things are working. And so, the platforms that I think are going to be most successful are the ones that are most flexible to allow different ways, different, different delivery styles, different testing styles, and even customizing and personalizing it to individuals who may, who undoubtedly vary a lot from person to person. And just as we've seen a revolution in music and media and news and, and, and all these other industries, I think we're on, in the beginning of a revolution in, in education. I'm going to just step in here for if you think about this revolution in education, mm -hmm. okay, does this end up, I'm going to go back to the original question, does this end up help resolving the, the job question? Is, does it make it easier for people to sort of learn what they need to learn to become productive? Does it reach down to the people who, who don't have a college education at this point? Because I'm sort of... For sure, for sure. I mean, I mean this can dramatically... Mean, you know, MITx is free, and a lot of these other other Coursera, a lot of the, those courses are, are free too. There's charges for testing and certification uh, that are coming, but it, it could be much, much more widely available. 
And that is absolutely, you know, um, there's this great book, The Race Between Technology and Education. I should mention that title in, the, in this panel uh, by Claudia Golden and uh, Larry Katz, which talked about how all through the 20th century, actually even the 19th century, the reason America had such high growth rates is because we had the most educated population and, more importantly, the most rapidly increasing education of the population. That stopped happening about 20 years ago. We are no longer the most educated country, and we are, and, and by some measures, the people who are in their 20s today are less educated than their parents, which has never ha happened before in, in, in hundreds of years. So we've got to, to reverse that, and the only way to do that, I think, is not just by spending more on education, although that would probably be a, a good thing to do, but it's by having this, this productivity improvement. It's also going to lead to some, some big changes in, in the way education, the industry of education. I think it's going to become much more of a winner-take-all uh, group where, where schools like perhaps Wharton and, and certainly MIT are going to uh, uh, be in a position <laughs> Berkeley, don't forget Berkeley. and Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe even Stanford. Um, so, and, and, but there will be a lot of schools that, that also, and maybe MIT will be one of them that, that struggle in that, in that new world. So there, that, that will be a, a, a part of the transformation as well, but that, that's probably a healthy thing. Next question. Yeah, I haven't heard any real discussion of income inequality. And that certainly seems to be a very big elephant in the Bay Area. I think there's, an impl there's been an implicit discussion in terms of discussing who's been falling and coming ahead and who's been falling behind. Do you want to add more? Sure. Uh, probably the most important development in the U.S. labor market over the past 30 years has been uh, a vast increase in the demand for highly educated workers and a vast decline in demand for, highly, for less educated workers. And I think that's at the heart of the, the, the increase in, in income inequality nationwide uh, as well as in the Bay Area. A lot of people focus on the 1%, 99% division. I, I think the real division is the, the, division, the, the, the difference between the 35% of workers with a college degree or more and the 65% uh, of workers with an high school degree or less. Uh, the first group, you know, since 1980, workers in the first group, their wage has increased uh, by about 30%. Workers in the, form, in the other group, the less skilled workers, their wage has declined by 15% in, in real dollars. Okay, so the, for the 65% of workers who don't have a college degree, their, their, their real wage has declined 15%. These two numbers, to me, are the key facts to, to keep in mind when you're thinking about inequality. It's not really about, in my view, it's not really about the 1% or the 0.1% or the, you know, the billionaires or the Mark Zuckerbergs or the CEOs or the hedge fund managers. It's really about average workers with a college degree versus average workers with, with an high school degree. And so in that excellent book, uh, the, the, the race between education and technology, that was mentioned earlier, uh, the main point there is that um, you know, while the demand for skill and for highly educated workers was increasing, the supply was not keeping, keeping pace. And that's really the capital sin of, of the U.S. Uh, education and social policy of the past 30 years, that there were not enough uh, support for, for college education and high school education. Uh, to keep pace with increased demand. And that, that ultimately generated increase in... in so so, so, uh, so I, I, I agree with, with the, the importance of what, what economists call skill bias technical change, and especially in, during much of the 20th century with that, that book uh, talked about. But um, as I mentioned briefly in my opening remarks, um, there's at least two other kinds of technical change that I think are at least important, and I have to disagree that, 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 that that's still the most important one. I wrote a lot of... I wrote some papers on skill bias technical change, but I have to say that today, Capital bias technical change and more important, what I'll call superstar bias technical change is more important. Um, if you look at what's happened in the past 10 years, about 65% of the uh, total GDP growth has gone to less than 1% of the people. So it's not so much the, in college educated people, the rest of the college educated people have had roughly st uh, stagnant wage growth. So there really has been a, a, a pulling away of a relatively small group, just if you look at the, at the numbers. That's not true in the 1990s and 1980s, but if you look at the past decade. And similarly, there's been the shift between capital and labor in terms of the shares of, of the economy. 
all three of those, skill bias, technical change, capital bias, technical change, and superstar bias, technical change, they all lead to increased inequality, as, as you've been sec suggesting. And it's one of the reasons why, although in the 20th century, uh, GDP, productivity, and wages all went up together, in the past decade, they have diverged. And ultimately, this growth in inequality, as you suggest with your question, is at the root of much of the job question that we're talking about here today. Because when there's less demand for people with, uh, in, in those three losing categories, then not only do their wages go down, but at some point they drop out of the labor force. Um, they, you can't find, they can't find jobs at all. So it manifests itself both in a decrease in what economists are called the price of labor, i.e. wages, but also in the quantity of labor, i.e. Uh, the employment to population ratio. Those are all symptoms of the same underlying set of technological drivers. Well, uh, let me raise one other point. Michael Twee alluded to this uh, in his remarks. Uh, namely, in the last 30 years, a billion people in the world have been lifted out of poverty. So suppose we went back to 1980 and we got a distinguished group of economists and said, would it be possible that you would find a billion people could be lifted out of poverty, join the, the world uh, labor force, and unskilled workers in the U.S. would only see a 10% drop in their wage? Well, the economists would all say, no, that would be ridiculous, impossible, how could that ever happen? In some sense, it's amazing that we've done as a country as well as we have, given this uh, given this remarkable change. Next question. So I have engineering degrees, uh, which makes me very fortunate. I guess not the right ones. It turns out for Silicon Valley, but. <laughs> <laughs> what are your engineering degrees in? Uh, industrial engineering. It's but coming back to that. <laughs> it's not a bad approach. Uh, but I guess my question is, first day of engineering school, uh, the dean got up and said, look left, look right. They're probably not going to be there when you graduate. And it turns out he wasn't wrong, because freshman year, you know, my hardest classes, or my, I'm sorry, my easiest classes were some of my friends that weren't in engineering school, hardest classes. So I guess I wonder if they had said now, you know, maybe look left, look right, yeah, that's math still holds, but what if you know you're going to pay one third of the tuition they pay? I wonder what the kind of outcome of engineering school enrollments or STEM. I've never heard that term before. How does that change? And I guess maybe just a question on immigration because a lot of people, and certainly I help run a technology startup company. I'm very lucky to be part of that. Uh, so I've tried to bring engineers here, uh, not because we don't try and hire locally. It's because we're incredibly picky. We'll talk to hundreds of engineers from the best schools and say yes to maybe one or two. I mean, we're talking like a, a percent of highly qualified kind of vetted candidates. So we try and bring somebody from somewhere like in India, and this guy's a closure contributor, and you guys probably don't know what closure is. I didn't know what it was until recently. It's this kind of new Lisp language, which is what highly scalable systems are written in. Like, this guy is world class. There's no question. It turns out if you're Indian, single, uh, highly educated, uh, chances are a male, you're not coming here unless you get an H-1B. So I get why we'd want to bring and import this labor. But I guess my question is, what happens in India when that guy comes here? So it's a, gr it's a great question. And let me recommend uh, Annalise Saxinian's book on the uh, new Argonauts, which is about the role of immigration in Silicon Valley. And we've heard a lot about the uh, forces that helped make Silicon Valley what it was. But one of the, what it is today, but one of the really big forces is immigrants, and, and it was basically immigrants from Taiwan and from uh, India. And it was that pool of labor that was able to create uh, the kind of success story that we see. Now, what happened with many of those workers? Well, some of them went back to Taiwan and created another Silicon Valley or chip manufacturing capability in Taiwan. Some of them went back to India and created the, uh, uh, the Bangalores uh, of the world. So uh, Annalise Axinian uh, has, uh, has said we don't need to worry about brain drain. Emigration means a completely different thing now than it did 40 years ago in the age of the internet and the 747. It's really brain circulation that makes the world work. And it's that brain circulation that the India is getting out of the sending that engineer to, the, to Silicon Valley. Well, I think that we've come to the end of our time here. I want to give a big hand for our panelists.
like to thank our speakers for sharing your insights and your perspectives so candidly, very meaningful as a small gesture of our gratitude. We have for you two things. First, the prestigious Churchill Club speaker t-shirt. Oh, oh. <laughs> Next, the handy USB drive from Wharton. All right. Let's enjoy those. Uh, the, there will be beverages served until 9 o'clock. So if you'd like to stick around and continue discussing, please feel free to do so. This program will be available on Churchill Club's YouTube channel tomorrow or the next day, so feel free to pass along the word there. Certainly want to thank Doug Collum and Wharton for hosting this, and you have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you. 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 Thank you.